But the most important thing that a believer needs to really know is how do I be victorious in this new life? The Bible says that you've been now made the righteousness in Christ. He didn't say you were in the progression of being that. He said you've been made that. Amen. What I like about God is every time God did something to me, he did it instantaneously. It wasn't this progression of things, right? I know I'm working out my salvation in the faith, but that's talking about your soul. But when your spirit, God says, okay, then when you accept it, you believe it, boom, you, you saved. Amen. Then he said, you're righteous. Boom, you made right. You made righteous. You made righteous. Say, say, I always win. I always win. win. Say, I got to find the promise. I got to profess the outcome. I, I've been saying this right here. I predict the outcome based upon the promise. I predict the outcome based upon the promise. See, I don't, don't worry, because I, I got a team now that's working on when I sell these little tweet stuff. They go and they, they, they get it licensed before y'all go and put it on y'all T-shirts and bootleg it. Somebody's looking around like, oh, man, I was getting ready to put that one on a shirt, too. Uh, <laughs> look, at Luke, <laughs> look at Luke chapter 10. I want to show you something real quick. Luke chapter 10. Hallelujah. Set faith, and I always win. Luke chapter 10, and then I also want you to turn to Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, hallelujah, Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 4, okay, and Luke chapter 7. You think you can keep up with all those? Luke 10, Luke 4, Luke 7. Everybody there? All right, Luke chapter 10, let's start reading here in verse 30. It's the story of the Good Samaritan, and we know it, most of us do. Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. This is a very good example of what the devil does to the people in the body of Christ. He goes and strips them of their anointing as much as he can. He tries to wound them so they won't have a desire to go back into the place to get healed again. And then he leaves them as if they don't have a way to come back to life. But you need to understand something. Once you're born again in the spirit, the devil can't kill you. Amen. Verse 31. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So the, people who, the person who's actually called to help the people ran away from a person in trouble. And it looks that way today a lot of time that the church run away from helping people. Let's keep reading. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan capitalized, most people know that this is in reference to Jesus as a type and shadow, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. That's a reference to Matthew 20, verse 34. So he went to him and and bandaged his wounds, Pouring on oil and wine, he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. And now we've already gone through the financial teaching on this before because I told you that that gentleman is operating under a blank check anointing, meaning that no matter how much you charge, you can't bankrupt me. Now, I want to give you a reference to this tonight so that you understand something. No matter what your problem is, it is not impossible for God. So when you come to the Lord with a problem or a situation or a test or a trial, you need to understand that you should have the ability within you to take that by the promise of the word of God, go to God and trust and believe that whatever it takes, God has the answer. The challenge becomes this is that a lot of times we believe that God can do something, but we're not sure if he will do it for us. And you need to erase that from your mind and understand that God has freely given you all promises for the purpose and the intent of you living the lifestyle of a redeemed, born again, set free righteousness of Christ person. Say, so so I'm not just saved. I'm born into a new kingdom. kingdom. Now, that's important. So hold on there. Now, the next place I told you to go was Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, let's pick it up in verse 2. Being tempted for 40 days by the devil, and in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when he... When that when they had ended, he was hungry and the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, it is written, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of 
God. The reason most people in the church are hungry is because they're not feeding on proper bread. The reason most people in the body of Christ are hungry because they're not feeding on proper bread. You know, there's a difference between you being inspired to do something versus you actually having an impartation to accomplish something. And you got to get from a place of just wanting to have somebody to cheer you along and through your problem to a place to where you get to a point to where you get instructions on where you can now step out and do something you've never done before. This, don't get me wrong, there is a place for exhortation. It is part of the gifts that God gives to the body of Christ. But exhorting you is not enough to instruct you because you can get emotionally excited about the truth and never get the instructions inside of you how to go and do the truth. Okay? So now, here we go. We see situations where now we have an unlimited release no matter what it is you need to spend, you spend it and I can take care of it. I got news for you. Your faith can solve any problem. Amen. So we go from Luke 10 to Luke chapter 4 and we now see something very significant here. Let's keep reading. But Jesus answered him saying, it is written, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. It's like a vision or a movie. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship me for me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And in their hands, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an appropriate time. Now, let's go back here on verse 4. It says, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Why is this so significant to me? I want you to keep that in your mind. Now turn over to Luke chapter 7 and say, I live by the word. I live by the word. I live by the word. Luke chapter 7. Now, in this chapter, you got to understand that John is going through a pretty significant situation. Verse 19, and John calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus saying, are you the coming one or do we look for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, are you the coming one or do we look for another? And that very hour he cured many of infirmities, afflictions and evil spirits and to many blind and gave sight. Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, praise the Lord Jesus, the poor have the God gospel preached to them and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. So in other words, when you do the works, you're going to offend some people. But now here's a question for you. Why would John be asking this question? John has already had an experience. John sees the dove descend down on top of him. John hears a voice that comes directly out of heaven telling him the one to whom you see the dove comes upon him or like the Holy Ghost. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. But now his situation is, watch this, making him question the word. True faith in any situation that we go through always goes back to the root of the word. If you don't have the word, you don't have faith. And if you're in a faith fight without the word, you will not win. Now, I got good news for you. There's not anything that the devil can do that's permanent. I'm going to let this say law on you a second again. There's not anything that the devil can do to your life that is permanent. He put Joseph in the bottom of the prison through all that time, even Joseph not even having a revelation of the unction of the Holy Ghost because they didn't have the Holy Ghost in them. He didn't know that Satan was behind all this work. But yet in the midst of it, he said, God has sent me here. No, God used that situation to put him in a place to be a blessing to his brothers and to his family. But I got news for you. The devil was trying to kill him. Amen. Amen. But yet, through the midst of that, God was able to raise him up from the very bottom of where he was and place him to a place. Why? Because he believed the word. All right? Word. Now, 
I know it sounded like I was getting ready to start preaching, but I wasn't. But I mean, I was getting excited there. Now, turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Hebrews 11 and verse 1. I'm hot. I'm sweating already, y'all. Praise the Lord. All right. Okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. You got to love Don Green, don't you? Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Come on, read it with me. No matter what chapter of translation you're in, I'm going to give you time to get there because I want you to speak this out. I want you to say this out of your mouth. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Praise God. Ready? Now, read it with me. Now. Now, faith is the. Say it, say it. Faith is the. All right, so. The, so, substance. Faith is the. Substance. All right. So then, so so so, so faith is something. So the, so now, one of the things that we have to acknowledge in the body of Christ is that faith is not vapor. It's not this unseen thing from the standpoint that it doesn't exist. It's not this physiological thought process of just who I am and la la land. I got incense burning in my living room. I'm sitting with my arms and my legs crossed and I'm in faith. Yeah. No, the Bible is very clearly says that faith is substance is something. Now, the question becomes is where is it substance at? All right. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. All right. Let's stop there for a second, because this is either the King James or New King James. They're just saying it is the evidence of what? Things not seen. All right, so now. Now faith is the substance. Faith is the. All right, so faith is something. Look at your neighbor and say, faith is something. So listen to me. There's no such thing as blind faith. That's a false statement that the devil has tried to get the church to buy into in making people think. When I say this, I don't really see it. I don't really know it. But in reality, I'm just saying it because that's what I've been taught to say in church. And the problem with it is it waters down your hope and it prevents you from entering into belief. Because anytime you think of something as being blind, you believe of it being unseen. And I got news for you. I have seen people and I can see when they're in faith. All right. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hope is the blueprint of what it is you desire as the outcome. Listen, you can't build a house until an architect builds it and draws it out. But the first place it gets built is in the mind of the architect and then it's put on paper. So you need to understand something that just because it can't be seen by someone does not mean it does not exist. All right. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. So if you have lost hope and the enemy is trying to make people lose hope every day. I was talking to a person this week even when I was in Vegas. Uh, I was where we were staying there at the Caesar Palace Hotel uh, for the conference. And I went outside just to get some air, as I mentioned to you all earlier. And there was some gentlemen sitting there, and there was some homeless people sitting on it. And, and one of the little guys had a sign that he had written out. He says, uh, would you be willing to give a person who has lost all hope something? And so uh, I walked by, had just gotten a, a couple of bottles of water, and, and I saw him there. And, and I looked at him, I told him, I said, don't give up hope because you needed to go to faith. And, you know, folks just walking by and everything like that. And so I handed him a bottle of water. And then he said, uh, how about some money? <laughs> it's 107 degrees. He's sitting on concrete. <laughs> I give him a bottle of water. And he said, how about some money? And I looked at him. I said, I said, you ain't lost hope. You just hope in the wrong thing. He said, I don't want the water. That's what he told me. He said, I don't want the water. I want to, and you can use bathe with it. But I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> I did not. I'm just telling you that thought. <laughs> See, I, y'all, I mean, because he was dirty and nasty and everything. He said he didn't want to walk. I was going you can bathe with me. I didn't tell. I said, that's what I thought. See, y'all should be like, Pastor, you maturing. Amen. Because at the time, I would have told him. I mean, because I'm saying, I mean, you could have poured it on yourself. It's hot outside. It was hot. 
That concrete, I'm, I can feel the heat coming up off that. It's 107 degrees, folks. Concrete, and he's sitting on it. And, then, and so I told him. And so uh, the reason I, get, I told you the story is because I was walking in. I was going into the, the, other, the other hotel directly across from the Caesar. And the, this gentleman stopped me. He said, what did you mean by that? And, I, and he hit me. I said, oh, it wasn't for the guy sitting on the concrete. <laughs> he asked me, he said, what did you mean by that? I said, what do you mean? He said, what you just said. I, I said, you got to believe in the image of the outcome for faith to produce it. He looked at me. He says, I keep seeing the wrong picture. Now, I don't know what he's talking about. I just met him. I mean, he heard me talking to a homeless guy on the street, and he stopped me going into the building. He said, I keep seeing the wrong picture. I said, well, what picture is it? He said, well, I don't want to tell you. He said, because I, I, I don't know you. I said, you don't want to stop me. I didn't start the conversation with you. You started the conversation with me. But that's okay. Sometimes people don't, you know, he didn't know me. I said, I said, listen to me. I said, until you give God an image to bring to pass, he didn't have anything to manifest. Now look at your neighbor and say, get an image of your breakthrough. Now, now, you have an action in faith. Before we go any further, before we look at the next phase of faith, if you don't address the first part of Hebrews 11 and 1, all the promises of God will not matter to you if you don't capture this next piece. Oh, it says Faith Friday. It's faith Friday. Yeah, it's Faith Friday. Hallelujah. You're going to lose it seven days a week, 30 days a month, but it's Faith Friday. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Stop. If I don't have a hope for something, the next part of the verse does not even matter. Can you see that? All right, I'm going to read this in a couple of translations. We're going to have to coordinate me a table or something for Sunday because I can already tell this is, yeah, maybe we're going to move it there or something for Sunday. All right, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm going to read this to you in the Amplified. So, Pastor, you ain't read the whole scripture yet. I know, but I, I'm going to get you on the first part. We'll get you through the first part of this. Then, I mean, maybe you'll be ready for the rest part. Amen? Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 11. I'm reading in the Amplified now for clarity. Now, faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for. All right, now, the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed. Uh, I mentioned to you all a while back when Pastor Regina and I first moved into the house where we are, uh, the blessing of God just supernaturally brought things into our lives and uh, all of our appliances and everything that we bought, I mean, we bought them debt free. I mean, we really did. God just supernaturally provided. And one of the things that happened was we had uh, released our faith for a specific kind of refrigerator. And Pastor Gina said, this refrigerator I desire. We went to Sears and we, we, it was early. The house wasn't going to be finished in February. This is July, August sometime. Okay, because we thought it was going to be finished like around November, December. And we went, okay, and the weather did, okay. And we went and looked at this during the summer. So this must be June, July. We go and look at the refrigerator. And we had already sown a seed for it. And this is what the gentleman told us. He said, well, look, we're going to run a sale before your house is finished. He says, I'll call you. And I'm thinking, okay, is this guy really going to call me? I mean, because, you know, he didn't know me. And, you know, and I'm just, you know, he said, well, don't buy it right now. And, and the Lord, and so we did what he told us to do. And he called us, sent me an email and called me. Said, hey, Mr. Shaw, I'm calling you back. We're running these things on sale. We're going to have a special pricing. And then if you buy it with your Sears card, then you're going to, you know, we're going to give you an additional percentage off. When we bought the refrigerator, the man told me, he said, okay, he said, here's your refrigerator. And then he gave me a ticket. And he says, this is your refrigerator until it shows up. <laughs> ain't, no, ain't no ice maker on it. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Because, see, sometimes the way we get conditioned in the world, we tend to look for things that God didn't tell us to look for to make us believe what God has said is true. And you are looking for a natural confirmation on a spiritual promise, and that's not the way God designed for faith to work. The only thing God gave you to look at was the blueprint you create for yourself of your hope, because the part he gave you was spiritual to hold on to it to bring it to pass. So when I release my faith, my title deed, my confirmation, my assurance of what I have, now watch this, 
has to now come out of a relationship of me trusting the one who spoke it to me. Well, now let's go back to Luke chapter 10, what we just talked about. And the gentleman said, no matter what it is you spend, I will pay. It requires trust now. Because, I mean, the guy going to be back there, he's going to be like, can you get some water? He's like, I don't know. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't drink all the water up that he paid for. And he said he ain't going to be back for three days. You're going to get thirsty because I don't mean, I don't believe he's going to pay me. Stop for a second. That's what Christians are. The church has gotten to a point to where we will say we're in faith, but then we do other things to try to undergird what we say faith is. And the reason we do that is because we want to make sure we feel like we're secure in what we're believing for. Faith is trusting God's truth over the lie of your circumstance. Regardless of the prevailing circumstance of the lie, I stand until truth prevails. I don't get moved because what I'm looking at hadn't changed because I've learned to accept God's word as truth over everything else. Say this with me. Say, I believe God's word. All right, now, let's go back and finish reading here in the Amplified Hebrews chapter 11 again. It says, now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for, being the proof. Say, now, it, faith is the proof of the things we do not C, tell your neighbor, say, I got proof of my breakthrough. All right, now, we're gonna, it's real simple. We're not going to overthink this tonight. I have proof of my breakthrough. I say it again. I have proof of my breakthrough. Now, I'm going to make a statement that not everybody can handle when I say it. Everywhere I have proof, God has never failed one time on what we're standing for. Now, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. Oh, that's how Pastor Copes. Praise the Lord. We're going to pray for him. We understand, you know. That's just how it is for him. Yeah, we're going to lift him up tonight. Oh, praise God. No, I don't want you to lift him up because you don't know any word. <laughs> no, no, I ain't talking about y'all because y'all, yeah, praise the Lord. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about folks who don't understand that. Watch this. Because in their mind, if they can't see my proof, then my proof ain't real. But my faith is my proof. And my faith is spiritual and not natural. My faith produces natural results. My faith produces natural manifestation. But my proof is the word. Now, let's take something simple. We're not gonna over, I, I told you I'm not going to make you overthink this. You have a financial situation going on where you need, give me an amount. Somebody throw me an amount out there by faith in Jesus' name. 5,000? Okay, you tilted some folks in, but that's okay. Can we, let's bring it down a little bit. I'm all right with the 5,000. <laughs> Stop calling your bill money now, but that's all right, praise the Lord. How about this? $250. We're going to use that as an example. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but I decree in the name of Jesus, your car note, your insurance, your house note, and your rent is paid in Jesus' name. That's what the Lord said those amounts were. So who we call them? Okay, now. That $250 in reality is not what you need. That $250, watch this, is what has been assigned in the natural to what you're trying to take care of in the need. Oh, okay, okay. Let me give you an example. The guy sitting on the street hungry says, I need $2 so I can get me some food. He didn't need two dollars. What the real need is what? Food. Everybody see that? All right. So then the person who is standing in faith for this, say they rent, they say, well, I need eight hundred and fifty dollars to pay my rent. No, you don't really need eight hundred fifty dollars to pay your rent. What you need is your rent paid or your rent forgiven or your rent credited or your rent covered for that month. Everybody follow that? So then what the devil does is that he tries to get you focused on what you think you need versus taking care of the need. Okay. And faith is designed to eradicate the need. Fort McCullen, uh, 1994. 
This must have been the summer. Regina was, uh, yeah, you were showing. So Regina was five, six months pregnant, I guess, with Cody during this time period. Uh, this was the staging place for the unit that I was assigned to when I was going uh, overseas a lot. And because of the unit that I was assigned to uh, and the, some of the things that we were doing, our family was told that I was always in Alabama. And it was just for security purposes and, and stuff. So, um, but when we were finished, we would come back and we were staged there. And so one particular time, Pastor Regina came down to come see me. This was 4th of July weekend, I believe it was. What? 4th of July weekend. And you guys have heard the testimony. It said, faith always rules. Now, faith knows how to use everything in the spirit realm and the natural by the promise of God to bring things to pass in your life. So when I'm standing in faith, now faith is the substance. So it is something. It's not pretend. It's not make-believe. It is something. It is not pretend. It is not make-believe. It is something. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. I have to have a hope. I have to create an image. If I don't have a hope for what it looks like, then there's no good for me to even read the latter part of the scripture because there's not even anything in the blueprint to bring to pass. So you say, well, girl, I'm just believing the Lord's going to make a way. All right, what does making a way look like? You know, because you'll get to saying traditional sayings and things that have no bearing on what the image of the breakthrough looks like. So there's nothing for faith to even manifest. I know the Lord will make a way. Okay, what does will make a way look like? See, you need to be able to say, girl, I, the Lord then brought me my 2012 red truck. At least you got, now, you need to be clever. I mean, do you mean a Dodge truck, a Ford truck, whatever it is? But at least you have an image. Now, don't be upset if you get the kind of 2012 red truck and there's a Ford and you want a Chevy because you didn't specify. Everybody follow that? So you need to be specific with your faith. Now, we're not talking about just things. I'm using this as an example of an image so you understand the very basic functionality of faith and how it works for the believer because the reality of it is, which we'll get to here in the next 20 minutes or so, the main part of my faith operates off the promise that God has made to me and that that promise cannot be changed because the circumstance look like it has changed it. Okay? All right, now. Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, and he, uh, no, 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 um, think of, go to Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, we're coming back to Hebrews 11, go to Romans chapter 3 first, I think it's verse 6, but I'm, I'm going to verify, Romans 3 and verse 6, and, and if, you know, if I'm wrong, y'all let me correct it, right, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, Romans chapter 3. Here we go. Romans chapter 3, we're going to start reading at uh, verse, let's pick it up at verse 3. It says, but what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true. Underline the word true. But every man a, all right, now. Now, let me explain that scripture, because for a long time when I read that, I always thought that what it was saying is that only God can say truth and men were always lying. Yo, okay, y'all didn't think that? I, I thought that was what it meant, because I, I mean, I didn't understand the scripture, all right? But that's not what that scripture is talking about. Let's go back to the, the scripture before that one. Let's look at it and apply it to where we're standing right now. Let's remember Luke chapter 10. Remember Luke chapter 4. Remember Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 10 was, I, I have an unlimited supply. Trust me, I can take care of it. Okay. Luke chapter 4, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word. Okay. Let's see. Just, it's a good class. Amen. Praise the Lord. Luke chapter 7 is because of your circumstances, John, you think my word has changed. It hasn't. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Holy Ghost, I said that. Uh, look at your name. It said, it said my circumstance. Has not, changed my promise. has not changed my promise from God. From God. All right, now, so Luke chapter 10 to Luke chapter 4 to Luke chapter 7, and now we just finished reading that faith is substance in Hebrews chapter 11, and now we're reading in Romans chapter 3. Verse 3, it says, For what if some did not believe? Say some. some. He didn't say all. So there are others who won't believe. That is a fact. But does their unbelief change anything? 
All right, now, here's the challenge for most believers. Most believers, including me in this situation for a long time in my life, there's not the fact that I didn't think God's word wasn't true. I just didn't believe it for me. And the real reason I didn't believe it for me is that it really comes out of relationship with God. Yeah, it reminded me. You see how the devil trying to do I say I cursed that in the name of Jesus. <laughs> mess trying to mess with me. Amen. Praise the Lord. We take all the squeak out. Not my squeak, but amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, what the devil attempts to do is to establish in us as believers a different truth factor different from the word. Okay? So then, there are certain things in your life you accept as fact regardless of what it is. You understand what I mean by that? Um, Regina and I went to a family reunion in Chicago. Um, gosh, it must have been 2008, I guess, 2007, 2008. It was on her family side, uh, for, for her dad's side of the family. And, and we drove up there, and as we were driving, uh, you know, I, I mentioned to you all, that's when gas first started going above $2 a gallon. Y'all remember that? Yeah, everybody remember that. Amen. Everybody talking about, I ain't gonna ever pay three dollars for a gallon of gas. And now, when you see three dollars a gallon of gas, you be, you, <laughs> you go across seven lanes just to get there, wouldn't you? Anyway, so um, we're driving it, and we passed this one particular sign. I remember because it was kind of late at night. We were coming through Missouri, and this one, this one sign, had on it, uh, gas, dollar sixty-eight cent a gallon. And there was a line of cars. We didn't need any gas at the time, so I just kept going. But there was a line of cars. I mean, a line of cars all the way back down to the, because I had to get over into the far lane to keep going on the interstate. Okay? Uh, and we go on up a few hundred miles, and I end up stopping. Uh, I think I was on 44, is where it was. I ended up stopping a little later, and we're getting gas. And this one guy just happened to say something to me. He said, uh, he said man, you, you, you see that, 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 that mess back there on the highway? I said, yeah. I said, what was all that about? He said, man, he said, I thought he was mad, too. He was cussing and everything, you know. He said, that blanket, the blank. He said, all that stuff back there. He said, he did, this is what he said. He said, it wasn't real. I said, what do you mean it wasn't real? He said, uh, now, a lot of y'all don't know this. They never assumed gas was going to go more. Check my mic. Okay. Y'all can't hear me. Okay, I think I'm good. I'm good, Josh? Okay. So, when they built some of the signs when they used to hang the numbers, this one particular one didn't have a, a way to hang anything bigger than a one in the very beginning. So gas was $3.68, but they didn't have the ability to change the first number because they had one of the older signs. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You know? Okay, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? All right, watch this. So everybody passing by the road, see the sign said gas $1.68 a gallon. What do you think they did? All right, wait, 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 wait. Did they know the owner of the gas station? No. Had they ever been there? Most of them probably no. They're just driving on the highway. But they be, and it drove them to action. That is faith in something that you've never seen, but you see for the first time that you're willing to accept this truth. When you get inside of you, that every time you read the truth in the word, that regardless of what everything else says and what everything else looks like, that you're willing to act on that truth like it is truth the first time you hear it, you will be able to enter into faith faster for the things you believe God for. Now, these folks never, I mean, these folks mad too, boy. But for, I'm telling you, all there was a mile of traffic. It was late at night. I mean, most of the folks were sleeping in the car. Miles of traffic all over somebody believing something because they just simply couldn't change anything. Okay? Now, I mean, if it hadn't been $2 and something a gallon instead of a dollar, I could see them. But now, gas, everybody everywhere is gas, almost four. Matter of fact, by the time we got to Chicago, gas was $4 and something a gallon. But they believe something else is truth. All right, now, what's your criteria for faith to accept it over your circumstance? What's your criteria for faith? All right, come on, don't y'all go to sleep on me. All right, now, criteria of faith, what do you mean by that? What does it take for you to believe? John chapter 20, let's go there. All right, and then we're going to go to Matt, Matthew, John chapter 20, and I mean uh, Mark, John chapter 20. I like this. Am I going too slow? I feel like I'm going a little slow. Yeah, I feel like I'm going slow. Y'all just saying that. I just feel like I'm going slow. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> Don Green, he got jokes tonight, doesn't he? Okay. Uh, John chapter 20, verse 24. John chapter 20, verse 24 says, Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. Say, seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, at this very moment, what Thomas has done is he's created a criteria on which he said he won't believe. He's basically saying, I need this proof to believe. Don't ever create a false criteria that God didn't give you on your believing. What's my criteria to believe? Say the word is true. Now, we just established that, all right? Everyone who don't believe, don't change it from being true. We just saw that in Romans chapter 3, verse 3 and verse 4. And now you got to establish within yourself, your circumstance cannot change the truth. Keep reading. It says, he said, I will not believe, verse 26. After eight days, the disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. You have to understand, he phased through the door. The doors being locked, he just showed up. He transitioned into the room. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be what? Unbelieving, but believing. All right. There's a difference between being an unbeliever and versus being in doubt. There's a difference between being unbelieving and being in doubt. OK. An unbeliever says, I have not had enough evidence on my own criteria to accept that is true. Okay? Man, I know what the best fried chicken in town is you can go eat. You can say, well, I don't know if I believe it. So you're unbelieving. Because you're saying, I need to taste that myself more than once to make sure they don't just have one good day. You see what I'm saying? So you got a criteria. I need to go to the restaurant at least two, three times before I accept that as a belief. Now, versus someone saying, man, I had the best fried chicken I ever had in my entire life. And somebody said, I doubt that because you ain't never been to this place I've been to. Now, what they're saying is this. No matter how many times I eat it, I still doubt it's going to be as good as. You see the difference? All right. So you have to make sure. We have to make sure. In my day-to-day walk with Christ, I have to accept this, is that every time I read the Scripture, every time I read the Word, regardless of what it looks like, I believe it because God said it. Now, that sounds a lot easier than what it is in the beginning, but it does get easy. Faith is easy. Faith is easy. It says, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me. This word seen in the Greek says, because you now have five physical sense realm proof. I have proof of what I can see, what I can hear, what I can touch. Because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. All right, now, we're going to get to the core of this. Say this with me. Say, I believe because it's truth. And that's my faith stand. My faith stand is because it's true. My faith stands is because it's true. Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. Pastor, we know that one. Why you didn't go there in the very beginning? Because the Lord didn't tell me to. Let me teach this the way the Lord told me to. You're just right. Praise the Lord. Amen. There you go sitting there trying to teach. Oh, let me do this. Amen. Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. Titus chapter 1. Hallelujah. I want to make sure. I'm going to need to read this in more than one translation, so I'm getting myself. Y'all ready? Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, and I'm starting reading in the King James first. It says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie. Say, God cannot lie. lie. Promise before the world began. All right? Cannot lie. The Amplified says this, resting in the hope of eternal life, which the ever truthful God who cannot deceive promised before the world or the ages of time began. See, God, truthful. Say he's truthful. All right, so God is truthful. So now, God cannot lie. The circumstance in your life, if you find the promise, because it has to be based on the word, and it doesn't align to what God says, you have to now determine in yourself one is truth and one is a lie. Okay? Now, let me show you how we do this. We do this by accepting salvation for what it is. It is a spiritual transformation and not a natural one. All right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting what? 
that life is Zoe, spiritual life. So now that spiritual life is now the answer to what Nicodemus asked Jesus in John chapter 3, verse 3. Can a man be born again once he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? And he says, no, a man must be born of the water and of the spirit. All right. That answer to Nicodemus, based upon the promise that he's given us in John 3, 16, that he talks to Nicodemus about in John 3 and 3 and John 3 and 5, is based upon the curse of Genesis 3, 17. Why? Because he gives a curse to man. He gives a curse to Satan, uh, the, the, the serpent, and he gives a curse to the woman. But there's a significant thing that he says to man at the very end of verse 17. He says, all the days of your life. So now I have to cut that life off. I now accept salvation. God so loved the world. I now activate Romans chapter 10, verses 8, 9, and 10. By faith, I'm now saved. Do you have proof that you are saved? How many of you in the house saved? Where's your card? Who gave you a card? I mean, did you wake up the next morning and the mailman said, hey, I heard you got saved yesterday. The Lord, you know, dropped down and drop shipped the uh, salvation card. Here it is right here. You need to carry it with you because every time people want to know if you're saved or not, you need to show that card. How do you know you're saved? No, no, I'm just saying. I mean, you know, I know you tell me you're saved. You know, you got a shundai and all that kind of stuff. But how do I know you're saved? I don't even know what's going on. Well, I'm just saying, I mean, how do you know you're saved? Well, I mean, well, well hold on a second. Says so where? Says so where? Show it to me that you saved, though. Where's your card? I mean, you got to have a card that says, you know, I, I accepted the Lord, you know, the second Tuesday in 1978. It came up off the morning bench, you know. I mean, I did. I mean, I, I got off the morning bench because all the kids were outside playing, and I wanted to go outside and play. My first cousin, who was two years older than me, told me, said, look, you want don't stay on the morning bench longer than Tuesday because you won't play, and we're going to be here all week, and we're going to be playing football. And on Monday, I saw him outside playing football outside the church. I'm like, well, I want to play football. My cousin said, I told you, you need to, take, you need to accept the Lord on Monday night. Now, this is a true statement. I don't know. There are more men who've accepted the Lord on Monday than women. <laughs> At least in the church where I grew up. Because them, 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 them teenage boys, but we're ready to get off that morning's bench. Amen? Right, the next time you see them, see them saying, about what day you got you know, born again on, you don't see no men on no Thursdays and Fridays. Like, we were getting out of there. <laughs> All right, come on. All right, now. So now, I get saved. I get born again. I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I now believe that in my what? In my spirit, as well as in my soul that I've had a transformation spiritually. Now, I still got to go through the renewing of my mind because, I mean, if you cuss before you got saved, unless you have a supernatural impartation of God withdrawing that from you, you'll still cuss afterwards if you haven't been taught any better. Well, no, I mean... You know what I'm saying, all right. I mean, if you used to smoke, and unless God supernaturally removed the taste of smoking from you, you'll still go out and have a cigarette right after you get saved, amen? All right, and there are a lot of other stuff you'll do too. I ain't going to go through the list. Now, so with that being said, I now say I'm saved. Now, you say you saved. How many of you say you saved again? Raise your hand. Now, show me you saved. No, 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 no. Show me. You, you. Show me, your, show me how you know. You see what I'm saying? There's nothing... For you to show me as proof that you are saved, other than the, okay. All right, hold on a second, hold on a second. See, don't, don't get too deep, because if you get too deep, you'll miss faith. Because see, what will happen is, you'll try to make this a spiritual experience of you explaining faith versus a natural impartation of operating in faith. Okay. I, I get, I know the angels were saying, I know all the heavens rejoice. I, I get that, I get that. But listen to the question. If a person who is not saved, that's how I'm asking the question, asks you to prove that you were saved, the only real way you could do it is to say, shoot me, promise me you won't get saved afterwards, and then in the rapture you'll see me. Because there's no way for you to show proof that you're saved. So what's your proof? 
Who said that word? So you have faith in God, in his word, that you're saved. I thought he was a God who did not change. I thought he was the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Well, then if he is, and he's the same God that you accepted his word as truth based upon the process that you are saved, why can't you accept that same word from the same God as proof that you are prosperous? How come you can't accept that same God on the same word as the same truth that you are healed? Why can't you accept that same God on the same word, on the same truth, that he is doing the same works of Jesus through you today? Amen. Say, faith does that. Faith, does that. faith connects me to the manifestation of truth. Faith connects me to the manifestation of truth. There's not this overthought process. Now, here's the challenge. We have to deal with the fact that our soul still says, well, I don't know about that. Because that's what we really deal with. There are things that come up in your life, you know, you say you don't know about that. I mean, I, I, when we were at the restaurant, uh, uh, I mean, at the restaurant, at the, uh, the conference here this week, one of the things that happened, there, I was sitting at the table with some guys from Georgia, and uh, we were ordering food and everything, and uh, they, they, they were bringing out alcohol and wine and all this kind of stuff. And so I just asked the guy, I said, hey, do, do you have you know, some water or some tea or something like that? And, you know, he says, he said, yeah, he said, man, we got some of the best tea in the United States. I said, no, just bring it. Don't, I, I don't want your claims to it because that's not true. So in other words, I know he's going to bring me brown water, but it's not the best. You know what I'm saying? Because in me, as rooted and grounded, there's no way that that far east of the May, <laughs> I, there's no way I'm going to find no good tea over there. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to get it on it. Now, if that is the case, I have to establish that the word of God is my proof, that the word of God is my evidence. Why? Because everything in God's word in my life is designed to be replicated off of heaven. Last scripture for the night, Matthew chapter 18. We're going to read from the expanded Bible. And we, uh, I'm sorry, two scriptures. I'm going to give this one, and then we're going to go to Hebrews 6. All right, Matthew chapter 18. I'm reading from the expanded translation. Say the impossible is the norm in God. The impossible is the norm in God. The impossible is the norm. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things. Say all things. All things. Matthew chapter 18, verse 18 says this way. I'm reading from the expanded translation. I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. The things, whatever you don't allow, forbid, bind on earth, will be the things God does not allow, forbidden or bound in heaven. And the things, whatever you allow, permit or loose on earth, will be the things that God allows or permitted or loosed in heaven. Also, again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about something and pray for it, for which you have asked, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Say, only what's allowed in heaven, only what's allowed in heaven. Is, really true. is really true. Everything else, Everything else. is just allowed. Just allowed. Only what's in heaven is true. Everything else is just allowed. What's truth? Truth is the word. All right. Now let's go and explain what that word is based on the covenant. Hebrews chapter 6. Same I'm reading from the expanded translation. Hebrews 6 verse 13. Everybody with me? For God made a promise to Abraham. Say a promise. There's a promise been made to you. When you leave here tonight, leave here knowing this. If God made the promise, he didn't change his mind. Oh, I need to read that other scripture too. All right. Let's read this. Uh, he Hebrews 6 13. God made a promise to Abraham, and there is no one greater than God. He used himself, vowed by his own name, swore by himself when he swore to Abraham, saying, I will surely or greatly bless you and give you many descendants. Abraham waited patiently for this to happen, and he received what God promised. People always use the name of someone greater than themselves when they swear. The oath proves is a confirmation that what they say is true, and this ends all arguing or settles the dispute. An oath by a higher authority is taken as a legal guarantee. God wanted to make very clear, demonstrate convincingly to those who would get what he promised, the heirs of promise, that his purpose or plans never change. So he made, confirmed, guaranteed it with an oath that these two things cannot change. God 
cannot lie when he makes a promise. God cannot lie when he makes an oath. He cannot lie. All right, then, then what's the issue that I need? Let's keep reading. These things greatly encourage us who came to God for safety, who hold on to the hope we have been given that's set before us. We have this hope as an anchor for my soul. Why do I need to anchor my soul? Because that will what, ooh, that's the area Satan attacks to try to make you accept something else other than truth. Faith stops working when your soul comes unanchored to the word. Faith stops working when your soul becomes unanchored from the word. Faith stops working when your soul becomes unanchored to the word. What do you mean by that, Pastor? That means when your soul will accept something that's truth other than the word, you are now no longer in faith. Well, then, Pastor, how long do I stand? Time has no bearing on truth because truth never changes. From faith o'clock to faith 30, that's your standing time. What, what can I stand for? For with God, Luke 1, all things are possible. And no word from God is without power or impossible of fulfillment. This is the confidence, 1 John 5, 14 and 15, that I have in him. That if I ask anything according to his word, I know that he hears me. And since I know that he hears me, what I've asked of him has been granted and given unto me. Confidence, boldness, trusting in his word, believing what the word of God says. Truth is always truth and it does not change. Amen. Say this with me. Say, I'm in faith. Based on the promise, Based on the promise. And, the promise and the promise is true. God never changes his mind. God, never changes his mind. God, cannot, lie. God cannot lie. My circumstance, My circumstance can't, change can't change the word, but the word, but the word will, change change will change my circumstance. You keep on watching. Keep on watching. Manifestation, is mine. Manifestation is mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say faith is easy, faith faith is easy. For, financial for financial breakthrough. Faith is easy. For supernatural healing. Faith is easy for a new house. Faith is easy for a new car. Faith is easy for my marriage to turn around. Faith is easy for resurrection. Faith is easy for building buildings. Faith is easy for my breakthrough. And I receive it now based on truth. Amen. We are dismissed.